Well, actually, James, like, tell me a little bit about like what what you have going on right now. Chief Growth Officer, I believe that's your title. Yeah. Um, and yeah, tell me everything that you're doing business wise with Ashley and just everything that's going on right now with you. Yeah. So we. Um, so, so I'm a little background. I'm really like a serial entrepreneur. I love the idea of finding gaps in businesses and then providing solution to the gap. And if you, I think if you can fill gaps, that's where all the money's made in the margins. Um, there's only going to be so many like Amazons, um, but you could be the box creator for Amazon and that's a gap mm -hmm. that they need filled. You could be the plastic bag um, supplier. Like, so that's how I think about business. Um, right. But what we're doing now is um, a couple of things that have always been important to me in real estate is, is one, um, distribution, and two, access. And so um, during my time at several real estate companies, Compass being one of them, so I spent some time there, but we, um, I found that one, agents don't have access to really good information. Buyers and sellers don't have access to really good information. And two, agents who don't have referral-only businesses can't control distribution. They're always going to some place to find qualified leads. And what you find is that the distributor at any given moment decides, oh yeah, we want a little more revenue. We want a bigger piece of the pie. So instead of you paying us $25, now give us 35%. Oh, now it's 40%. Oh, and by the way, it's 40% plus 250. And the gain, the goalpost just keeps moving further and further down the line. And so after leaving a couple of real estate tech startups, my thought was, how do you perfect this process for agents? How do you streamline and fill the gaps for agents first? That was my first thought. And so immediately we started um, down this road of like, why don't we just take all of the really good stuff that we did together while she was at Compass? So Ashley, my partner, she was an agent at, on a team at Compass, but she was ready to blossom and grow. And so she was like, well, what do you think? And so we put our heads together and we came up with some ideas and we went from a place where she was making thirty to $40,000 a quarter to a hundred plus per quarter and we're like okay this works let's see if we can do it with another agent so we took a new agent jeremiah um and he made a hundred thousand dollars his first year and so we're like okay so not only does it work for us it can work for somebody else so now how do we put this in place so all more agents can benefit from it and so out of that came a couple of things one was ashley's course so she went back and basically traced our steps Hansel and gretel style breadcrumbs all the way back to the beginning and um, we now have a bona fide way that agents can follow exactly what we did to success. So we have agents on our team that are now following that model. And so from there, um, that's we created Loving Atlanta Life. That's the original team that will actually create it. I joined that. But then we created Loving Realtor Life. And we said, mm -hmm. well, if we can help people in Atlanta. Why should we help people everywhere? Mm -hmm. And so Loving Realtor Life is now the brand or that's there to help agents all across the U.S. And so, okay, great. We solved the problem of fixing business hacks. You should do this in your business. You should say this. You should be this. This is how often you should follow up. This is the follow-up cadence. These are actual words. That, all the way down to the words you should say. Um, the follow-up plans, the text messages, everything we have it built out. All the secret business hacks, all the shortcuts, how to hire an assistant, how to know when to hire an assistant, all of the little things. We have that, great. Now we need to help agents um, do two things. And this is where I think brokerages fall really short on, is that either you get to a brokerage in the team and they say, hey, um, Cameron, we have leads. Work the leads that we give you. Um, we're gonna take a referral fee, but just work those leads. And you go, okay, great. And you run really hard and you work those leads. Um, and that's on this side of the business and you eat today. Mm -hmm. That's great. But they don't tell you um, anything else. They just say, do this. And then there's the other side of the game where they go, hey, look, we're not going to provide you with a ton of activity, but we're going to show you how to do it mm -hmm. so that you can be your own agent, so that you can learn to develop your own practice. And that sits over here, but that takes time. No brand is built overnight. There's no brand in the world. And I don't know why agents think they're an exception to this, but there's no brand that resonates with people that started overnight. It's always a development and this is where reputation and all of this stuff comes in, but it takes time to develop that. And so they either do this and say, we're going to give you some leads, run fast, or they say, hey, we're going to teach you how to do it, but it's going to take you six, seven, eight months before you even get a deal. Mm -hmm. And they go, yeah, by, by, while doing that, pester your friends and family. And they tell every agent, go to your sphere of influence and talk to them. And, and those are the people that are just close to you. That doesn't mean they're your sphere of influence. 
And that's a, another yeah. point that I believe to be true. And so mm-hmm. where we live is right in the middle. We're going to give you lead activity. So you have opportunities to win now, but primarily what we want to do is teach you how to do it on your own. And so we can marry those two things. You can mm-hmm. eat. It's the, it's the teach a man to fish while he fishes yes. <laughs> mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, or teach a man to fish while he's eating fish. Oh, he's having mm-hmm. a fish dinner. Better, mm-hmm. better said. And I look, I, I love fishing too, but I don't know anybody else who's fish. Fishing on an empty stomach is not fun. Mm-hmm. Or even just going to the grocery store on an empty stomach. You go on an empty stomach, you throw a bunch of stuff in the cart that you probably don't need. You're just not the best version of yourself. While yeah. you're in a scarcity mindset, or you're, uh, or you a uh, feeling of lack, where you're like, I don't know when it's going to happen, and mm-hmm. I think it's it's about having opportunities that are outsized to your capacity. And a yeah. lot of times, when you're on this side of it, you have a ton of capacity and no opportunities, so you feel pressured, and you go, Well, this deal has to work, mm-hmm. and you start calculating the commissions for the deal. And now you're like, dang, I have all these, I'm going to get this much money. And then a deal falls through and you're crushed. Yeah. And then you go, well, now I must have done something wrong. Instead of having a ton of opportunities that are greater than your capacity and go, well, yeah, look, I'm going to try this. Let's see what happens. Mm-hmm. Like, if it works, great. Like, I, I give you a good example. We uh, we, we have leads. So I think I have a break coming to this point in just a second. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. People, but I told you we have leads. And so... We have leads, but also I have data on 66,000 agents because of my past in different markets. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I can try different outreach methodologies. I can call people, I can text, I can email, but I don't mind when someone says, no, I'm not interested. Take me off your list. Okay, great. I even take it a step further and call those people and say, hey, why do you want to be taken off your list? Tell me. (laughs) So, So now I know. But if I don't have opportunities outside to my capacity that I could actually fill, then I feel the pressure of like, no, please, please. And, and now I'm, I'm rambling. I don't feel confident. Um, and the, the leads won't convert. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. this is where we try to marry that relationship between teaching agents, what we've learned through our now combined over a decade of in real estate space um, and over 200 plus, 50 plus homes sold, 50 million sold. We, we, we actually took the first part of this year off and basically sold nothing. And we now have 21 listings. Um, that mm-hmm. we're sitting on just by yeah. following the same methodology that we started in the past. So we're literally um, practicing what we're preaching. And yeah. so that's one lane um, that we're working on is how do we get realtors to a place where one, I don't, I'm not concerned about taking a ton of money from agents. Like I, I'm mm-hmm. really, I'm really not. It doesn't aid me at all. We're going to be mm-hmm. fine because we have the leads in our own market. So we get to sell that we get to do the same thing you're doing in another market. So mm-hmm. about changing pricing and all of that. And I have locked in pricing in perpetuity. And so I can always drive that for agents. So now you have opportunities, right? And so now you just need to learn the necessary skills to close the opportunity. And at some point you may say, James and Ashley, we don't want your leads anymore. I'm going to say, yes, thank you. That means you've figured out a way to drive that yourself through the learnings. But in the meantime, mm-hmm. let's make sure that you can take care of yourself. So that's one lane that we're driving down in terms of distribution. The other is access. And so what I did um, is not just for agents with access as homeowners and sellers, buyers, but particularly buyers. We, uh, when we started our partnership, we started a partnership with a hedge fund. And this hedge fund uh, had a ton of rentals in Atlanta, a ton. And they were like, hey, can you help us dispose of these rentals? We're not going to actually sell them. We're going to hold them. So we have like 500 rentals, please help. And so I said, okay, great, we're gonna help. And through the course of meeting five or 6,000 people in a six month span, we realized that there's a lot of fringe homeowners who just believe they can't get into a home. <laughs> and uh, that was a problem for me. And especially with home ownership rates with minorities in America, and it's mm-hmm. dwindling uh, further and further, they just don't understand or believe that someone's going to help them in the process. And they, they know the terminology, they weren't taught certain things. And so they don't have access to the right information and the resources. Mm-hmm. And so in conjunction with the local nonprofit called housing plus and the, they're backed by the United way, we're able to create a program called 12 months to home ownership. It's really a six month program where every month we sit them down with an expert, a lender, an agent, 
um, somebody in banking, somebody who um, helps them become economically better, someone who's focused on credit exclusively. Um, Stellar Pie is our credit partner. And so we sit down with these individuals over that six month period of time and teach them financial literacy. Mm. We literally walk step by step. This is the appropriate mindset to have. This is how you balance a budget. This is how you create a budget. This is how you set goals. And then this is how you map your way to a successful home ownership possibility. And rather they go through to that and own a home, it's up to them. I don't care. It's not, it doesn't bother me if they don't want to buy a home. But if they do want to, I want them to have access to the information. And so yeah. we took a cohort of 100 to start. Um, the United Way was really generous um, through Housing Plus, Inc. Um, they're giving, they're matching savings. So if you save 500, they're going to give you another 500. If you increase your credit score 30 points, they're going to give you another 100 points. If mm -hmm. you um, increase your income by 10% or more, they're going to give you another 100 dollars. <laughs> and so they have an opportunity to walk away after this with at least $700. Mm -hmm. At least. If they just sit in the classes, do what they need to do, save some of their own money, they're going to walk away with $700 and be a little bit better off financially. And so that's where we've tried to create access for individuals who are on the fringes of home ownership. And it's always been my belief that those are the most marginalized people, not the people who are way off or the agents who it, it's kind of like agents too. There's agents who are like right there, that two to six um, million in sales where they're like pressing up against, like, I think I'm doing this. I've been in the business a little over two years. I'm right there. Mm -hmm. um, what do I do now? Those are the people that are fringe stars in real estate that mm -hmm. no one ever pays attention to. They get, they're just caught in the shuffle of like, let's, these are the, what most brokers just call them rank and file. These are our rank and file agents. We don't, we're not going to pour too much into them um, because they don't have the cash. They have the really great people. And this happens at any business structure. The greatest people are the people who sell the most by hook or crook. It doesn't matter if they just mm -hmm. sell the most, they get the most attention mm -hmm. and the people in the middle get nearly nothing and the people on the bottom get attention because they knew where they're falling and they're like mm -hmm. well, we need you to continue to pay in so we need to push more people into the bottom and the, everybody in the middle kind of gets lost and so mm -hmm. i feel that same way about home ownership where an individual who's mortgage eligible they're the stars everybody's on them you want to buy a house you want to buy a house you want to buy a house you need a loan you need a loan you need a loan you have credit they want to give you credit okay mm -hmm. and the individuals who are so far off that it's not going to happen for them they pay them no money if mm -hmm. they get their stuff together, they will, but they just try to get new people in the, from the bottom. Just like, let's just see if they'll apply and see what happens. And those people who are right on the fringes are lost. Mm -hmm. And so that's the gap um, that I believe exists. And if we can help close that gap a little bit, then we're, um, we're doing the great work. Yeah, 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 100%. It's crazy, like everything that you're doing. It sounds like a lot, but I think it's very simple what you're doing in the sense that the core of everything that you're doing is discovering problems in the market and then offering solutions to them. And obviously you go through all your trial and error in order to do that on both those sides, that controlling the lead side and the access to information for the consumer side. Where did you develop that skill in knowing how to find problems in markets and, and how did you develop it? Yeah, I think it's... Uh... I think it, it, the roots, the really, the true root of it is my mother, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. I would ask her a question and she would say, go look it up. Yeah. Like, oh, always, <laughs> I have to do, and so she taught me to research. Mm -hmm. And so I loved research. And so I was always fascinated. And then I went to college and I had a really, I hate that I don't remember his name, but he was my, my, my macroeconomics professor in college. And he blew my mind with, um, cause and effect mm. and so I, I started to look at things from that perspective that oh if you do this it causes this and my mom's a psychologist and a therapist psychotherapist and so i've always been interested in how the mind works why people do things and so i think that's always been a personal nature my own curiosity and trying to figure, tinker with things and figure out if they work or not um I'm sure a lot of people get upset <laughs> while I'm doing it, <laughs> while I'm tinkering. <laughs> but um, but I think that's the best way. You if you don't experiment, um, how does anything grow? And how do you? And I'm, I'm a futurist. I, I think you should 
participate in technology. You should try to make some impact that moves all of us forward in an altruistic way. If you don't, um, why gear? Like, mm -hmm. what, and if you think from my perspective, if I just wake up, find a job, because I can obviously just go work somewhere. Find a job, go to work, come home, watch a couple hours of TV, wake up, do the same thing over and over again until I'm 70, and that's supposed to be like my promise, man. Mm -hmm. um, what impact did I leave positive? Likely it's a negative impact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, the, like, mm -hmm. or at least some negative impact. I don't have a car, and my car is <laughs> blowing gas everywhere. I'm, tr I'm trashing the earth. My mm -hmm. own garbage, my personal garbage, the stuff I use. And, uh, and so I've always been one about my own progress and then contribution, give something back to the world positively. So, yeah, I think yeah. it's innate. Yeah. I was asked that question the other day by uh, Joseph Limo. And mm -hmm. he was like, he was like, what do you think one of your gifts is? And I was like, well, problem solving. And he was like, where does that come from? And so it's interesting because I have like a very similar story to where my my mom had to tell me that that's what I was doing when I was younger because I was always that you know similar to you I was always looking at toys and like breaking them apart but I would never put them back together I broke them apart just to see how it was designed and yeah, and yeah but as a little kid you're just like playing you don't know like you're just like all right cool that's cool and so my mom would always tell me like as I grew up she's like yeah when you were little like you always asked me some very odd questions that. She's like sometimes I didn't have the answer to, <laughs> and, and so and she and she was curious on why I was so curious. Throughout your career, when did you figure out that that was a skill set that is very valuable in in the marketplace? Oh, that's a good question. Probably when I had like a because I played basketball, so that's not like a job um, to me. But when I got to JP Morgan, um, I realized that problem clients would kind of be pushed in my direction and they're mm -hmm. like i think you can solve this <laughs> and, and uh and so you you start to handle uh, i remember a really good example we had a, a lot of winner here and he yeah. won like seven or eight million dollars a lot of winnings um in atlanta but he's from the southwest atlanta the area that they say is not a great area so he won like a scratch on Mm -hmm. And um, they're like, oh, well, who are we going to send over there to talk to their lotto winner? And they're like, oh, you go do it. And um, I helped him. It, and I think part of it for me is less about like, can I make some money or whatever? Because you can make money. Like, if you have some skills, you can sell things and you can build mm -hmm. things, you can make some money. But can I actually help somebody? Mm -hmm. And can I figure out what, what problem they, I think that's the first step is problem finding. Can you find problems in things? And that's probably what happened when you were taking things apart. You're like, oh, okay, now I see how this is constructed and I can start to anticipate problems. Mm -hmm. and so that's where I, at JP Morgan, I learned that that was a valuable skill. Mm -hmm. And then what I learned is that that skill is transferable in any industry. You can drop mm -hmm. me in nearly any, any industry. Um, one, I, I will say this for anybody who is a good problem solver, don't try to solve problems that you're not interested in. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't work for me because uh, I'll immediately get bored. <laughs> and that's how, and you probably suffer this too, where you figure something out and you go, okay, well, that's already figured out. So now, now what? Now mm -hmm. what do I do with this, like, this stuff that I just have in front of me? Because now, now it's a redundant task. Yep. And so I, I think early on, I, I learned that, and JP Morgan's probably it's one of the best companies anybody could potentially work for. There's mm -hmm. a ton of smart people. Um, it's, it's challenging because you're going to be around a ton of smart people mm -hmm. and you don't want to be the asshole or the, <laughs> in the room. And so you're going to continue to evolve your own ability. And so I, th I think that's probably the place I learned it and started this journey. I think you're super right. Uh, 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 when it comes to the, I would say like solving problems that you're not interested in. I went through finding those problems, fixing them one time, and then that one time would spit out an outcome that was good for myself, either financially or for my health or whatever it is. And then I stopped doing it. And because I was looking for a new problem. Which creates a new problem. The second that you stop, you now have created. And so I, I've learned a couple of really key, key uh, principles that I, I like to live by. One, um, if it's a problem, I, I have this 
thought process. I work really smart unless working hard is the smart thing to do. Mm. And so a lot of time the redundant task is hard work because hard, it's only hard because it's tedious. Most mm. things aren't str that strenuous. Like we're not, we're not in factories. Like, let's be serious. It's hard because it's, it's hard because it's boring. Mm. And so how do you find ways to make the boring, um, okay to do every single day. Yeah. And so I, I attach those things to larger problems. And then I also tell myself that if I'm, if I truly want to be outstanding in, in my approach, solving a problem one time is not good enough. Mm -hmm. Because what if I got lucky? What if I was a lucky solve? Mm -hmm. And so I don't have enough data to determine if I'm doing it the right way or not. And so my sample size is too small. So it doesn't make sense for me to stop there. I should continue to push it and see, um, okay, I solved it one time. Let's see if I do this and I get the same outcome 10 times. Oh, mm -hmm. perfect. 300 times. Like the same thing with the leads and the agents. I, I took a sample size of 300, 400 agents with one messaging. And I was like, ah, oh, that's not resonating. I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I immediately changed the messaging and I was like, oh, okay. So this is converting. Five percent. The last message was converting at zero percent. Literally, not anybody mm -hmm. said they liked mm -hmm. it. <laughs> and so, you, I think if you're going to be a really good problem solver, those little like iterative steps that you take in, to making something um, its best version, not, not perfect because it's never going to be perfect. So not for everybody, but yeah. you can continue to iterate it until it's uh, reached its capacity. Mm -hmm. And once it's reached its full capacity, there's really nothing else you can do with that. Now you go solve a new problem, but you put somebody in place to manage the process. Manage That's the second it. part. Yes. You need a team. After you've iterated to a place where you're like, this problem has no more solving left in it. I squeezed all the juice out of it. Mm -hmm. Now let's find somebody um, who's steady, who likes the, the, the tasks. Mm -hmm. They live, they live in those spaces and you find that team. Now you can, now you've created a, a place where you can go solve the problems and not create problems back here. I would say up until I was like, probably like 27, 28, that's when I was like, dude, like you're fixing the problems, but you have to fix them over and over and over again. So you either make this a habit in your life or hire somebody to do this thing. And so, yeah. Right. And if you, yeah, if you, if you don't want to tolerate this activity, then that's the, 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 that's literally the only two options. That's the point that I got to. So it's like, those are your only two options. You're going to do it and just shut up, stop complaining about it. Just do it or go hire somebody and they can, they can uh, take care of the task for you in order to sustain the outcome, uh, uh, sustain the solution of the original problem that you had. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. I think you, you're right. You, you did say something, you said tolerated to me, toler tolerating something is pain, right? Mm. And I think there's really two types of pain. There's pain that's educational mm -hmm. and you go, Ooh, like you stub your toe and you go, Ooh, don't, don't walk barefoot in the dark in this room because I, I kick stuff. Mm -hmm. That's pain. But then there's like nagging, suffering pain where you're like, this won't get any better. Yeah. Suffering shouldn't be tolerated. You move that to somebody else. It's, it's yeah. not useful. Um, frankly, think about all the people who are old and they're suffering. Um, their quality of life is poor. They have mm -hmm. really poor quality of life because they're just suffering through something. Mm -hmm. um, any type of suffering I think should be attacked head on. You address it and you try to get it out either in the suffering in some way, um, move the suffering to someone else, uh, but you shouldn't just live in the suffer in, in a suffering state. It's not useful. But then the other pain that I'm talking about is like the pain of 200 agents saying, no, stop, no, stop, don't. <laughs> and I go, hey, you know I'm a real person, right? <laughs> and they go, oh, yeah, I thought it's all these messages sound the same. And I go, aha, there we go. Mm -hmm. They thought the messaging sounded just like the messaging that was uh, pushed to them and they found to be inaccurate or inauthentic. So yeah. now I need to change my message. So that's the pain that I love because that's the pain that actually helps you diagnose. You diagnose, you have a problem, you diagnose it. Mm -hmm. After diagnosing the problem, you create a plan, then you enact the plan and see if it works. And then you just keep going mm -hmm. until, until the will kind of starts to spin itself. And mm -hmm. then that's where you can put people in place 
going back into uh you were talking about um when you were talking about it i was i was thinking about like this like business in a box for for real estate agents when you're providing a solution to real estate agents that are either the ones that are getting fed by their team or they need to be doing the feeding for themselves you said that there was a methodology that you guys used that allowed you to you know ramp up production when you started working with ashley but then you guys stopped to I think like recalibrate as a business and then you ramped it back up. What was that methodology that allowed you guys to ramp things back up? So there's there's probably there's three sets of three steps that we take um, within the course, but it's it's really um, a couple of things that I think are important and it's probably two halves. A lot of times agents, uh, and I think I saw something today. I can't remember who said it, but it's really true of real estate agents is that there's really small tasks that agents should do daily. Um, and if missed, nominal, no effect to your day, mm. <laughs> no effect at all, but they pile up and then you eventually have no business. And so I think two parts, agents should work on and in their business. And a lot of times they're either working in the business and they're just like, huh, I just got all this stuff going on. I'm just going to keep, trudging through this and hopefully I just go from deal to deal to deal to deal to deal and they're living transactions to transaction or they're just working on their business and they're never interacting with clients or actually never taking on appointments and so what we did was both of those things simultaneously you spend time on it and time in it and strategically do those things so for us it was one we needed that lead distribution channel that was something that was on my plate. I was like, I have to figure this out. This is, if it kills us, I have to figure this part of this business out. Um, because one, I know the technical background side of the contract, she, she lives for that. So I know she's, if we get somebody to that place, between the two of us, negotiation, we love, actually we live in that space all the time. We should hear our, our personal conversations. Um, <laughs> but I knew that the team could handle that. And so now it was about finding the right strategic partners to help push our business forward. Um, and so how do, once we have the leads, what do we do with them? Mm. So we're like, okay, now we need to find a call center because we can't possibly make all of those calls. Ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So we find a call center that's going to present us the right type of deal. So they mm. presented the right deal. We're like, perfect. This is the perfect partner. Then I had a pre-existing partner from a past business who, built a cash offer platform. Great. Mm -hmm. Now we have the ability to walk into a deal with a deal. Hey, Cameron, I saw that you, I saw that you're interested in getting offers for your house. Um, you said you wanted this price. We got you. Mm -hmm. We got some, we got, we got, we got offers for you immediately walking into the door. And mm -hmm. so now we, okay, great. Now we know that we have an opportunity to aggregate those offers in a unique way. And then we took our back end partners, our investors, um, that we personally know across the state and we, we added them to the, to the process. And so now we have a ton of listings through, um, building the business that we think the way agents should, and we right. probably have another twenty or so that are coming. I think we're, we're prepping, but we do a lot of deals off market too now. Mm -hmm. And so now we're, we're in this, uh, we're in that opportunity greater than capacity space that everybody should shoot for. You should shoot for that. Because mm -hmm. you can't close every opportunity. It's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. But I, if I have more than I need, who cares if I close them all? Mm -hmm. I just need to get better. And yeah. so that's what we did. We went back and said, what were all of the, what were the like little missteps? Like one thing that we did, we created these really robust action plans early on and they weren't necessary. Mm -hmm. Just one thing. And because they were so robust, we were missing the opportunity to interact with our own clients directly. Mm -hmm. We were, we spent so much time um, on the business that mm -hmm. we weren't even in it at all. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, okay, so how do we fix this so that the marriage works perfectly and symbiotically? We should be on and in at the same time and it shouldn't work seamlessly. And so we, we did that. We made sure we smooth rough edges because there's always those little friction points in, in terms of when to do a deal, how to do it, what you should say, how you should say it, um, when's the right time. We, mm -hmm. we started smoothing those fresh points. And so we were our own database, essentially. Like mm -hmm. we, we, we were tinkering with the business on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the best practice anybody can do is if you want to get better, um, track yourself. Yeah. Go back 
and retrace your steps and go, ah, that's how we did that. And you go, mm-hmm. man, remember, remember that? <laughs> yeah, that was a bad idea. We shouldn't do that anymore. Yeah. And so that was the process that we went through. And we we decided that, uh, one, I I am not your traditional real estate agent. Like my background is not in, in buying and selling homes. And I don't think that was ever the outcome for me. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. in order for me to help agents, I think I needed to sit and see. Right. I need to know, I need to see what they see directly and not just um, from the sidelines. I, the best, I think the best coaches have some experience at the highest levels. Yep. And so, like, you know, when you look at all of the great coaches that they've ever named, they played at that level. Phil Jackson was a professional basketball player, but he wasn't great, but he was a professional. So he knows what it's like in those moments. Mm-hmm. And so if you can't experience it, you shouldn't be giving advice on things you've never dealt with. Mm-hmm. And so this is us dealing with those same problems mm-hmm. and then triaging them and going, yeah, maybe we shouldn't triage it. Maybe we should just solve it completely. Mm-hmm. And now giving that back to agents. So basically you created a lead source plus the ISA, uh, uh, sorry, plus the uh, call center. And are they ISAs or like, they're like basically like yeah. you give them that title. Yeah. See, yeah. When they, when they call, they're calling from the loving and the life from the loving world to the light. And nice. so, we, we created the lead source, mm-hmm. we created the conversion opportunity, and mm-hmm. then we created the platform to close them on. And so yes. all parts of the deal are accounted for. Yes. So now all you have to do is not mess it up. <laughs> the, science, the science is not, you don't even have to be um, outstanding. Mm-hmm. You just need to not mess it up. Yeah. And I think that's, it. it were in the, my, a mantra that I have for our business, I have a lot of them, by the way, but one of them for our business is create products like Apple, but deliver like Amazon. Mm. And so my thought process is how do we make this process feel like when you get into it? And it says, hello, and you swipe, and it literally just walks you down the road. And then it uh, takes all your data from your past phone, drops it into the new phone, and goes, hey, just log into the stuff that you needed to log into, and you're going to be great. Mm. That's what we're looking at from our process standpoint how do we do that and then deliver like amazon for me is how do we create greater communication greater transparency how do we deliver the leads effectively quality product because amazon delivers but they don't back your stuff up on the way to delivery Mm -hmm. (laughs) right Mm -hmm. you're gonna and if they do then they go okay we'll write we'll write this wrong immediately so that's kind of how we we've been thinking about it yeah, a hundred percent. I love it too, because it, again, it's so simplistic. Um, but again, you're basically solving a big problem that that the majority, and I and I want to say, the majority of real estate agents have. I am, um, I am in a couple real estate agent Facebook groups, and I'm dead serious, James. I see the question of lead generation, literally multiple times a day, and it's the same exact question of. Basically, it all evolves around that. How do I generate more opportunities for myself? The simplicity of that, of what you've created stems from, you know, solving that problem. How do you, how do you then meet the demand with agents now for the, I want to say like the team leaders, the broker owners who are developing a a team within their area? Like, how do you balance that? Okay, we have lots of opportunities coming in. And we need to service them, but we also need to bring in real estate agents and train them to handle these leads. Like, how do you balance that? Yeah, there's a, when I was at JP Morgan, this, uh, I can't remember his name, but he was in the banking sector. He wasn't in the investment sector, but he would tell us this because we had bankers that we all worked with and did deals with. He would say, well, look, if a banker, if a banker reaches their goal, that means you need another banker. Mm Mm-hmm. And so um, that's always stuck with me that if they get close to reaching their goal or whatever goal that they've set for themselves or whatever goal we set for them, then you need a new one. And Mm -hmm. because uniquely I'm in position to interview agents, I think I've probably interviewed anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 agents at my time at Compass. And these are the agents in the top 10% um, of income earners for agents all across the the Southeast. And then when my time I left Compass and went to Ribbon, a power buying company, I was meeting with broker owners, like the owners and all of their agents. So I was pres- presenting to hundreds of agents or the top, I think my last meeting was the top 17 Caldwell banker owners across the nation. 
and I present it to them specifically and address their problems. And so you get to a place where you get all of this information coming in. Now you have the ability to, to diagnose who's going to do what really well. Like I, I do know that if an agent's been in the business less than 18 months, the likelihood that they leave the business is like 60%. Mm-hmm. It's just, it mm-hmm. just is. Mm-hmm. And especially now, given that everybody who just got in was here for 21 and 22, they're like, ha, this is easy. This mm-hmm. is, I'm a million, I'm going to be a million dollar listing agent. I'm, I'm the next uh, Josh Altman. Like they're yeah. immediately into that space and now they're actually dealing with problems. Mm-hmm. And so I, I know that those agents will like leave. I also know that uh, most agents don't know how to develop brands because no one's ever taught them that. And there's no barrier that says you need to learn how to develop brand building. And I also know that brokerages can't possibly teach that. There's no, there's, there's too many agents, far too many agents for most brokerages, one for them to, to teach them all. And so they're going to cherry pick the ones that they think are best. And so I, I, I know that to be true. And I also know that, uh, that there's agents, the agent, ideal agent for us is Ashley. Mm. She is the ideal agent because we know that if she does, can do this, if you're like her, you can do it. Mm. We've seen it. We've seen it play out. I don't expect an agent to be like me. I'm, I don't sell houses that often. So I don't expect you to, to think the way that I think. I probably have this really abstract view of things and mm-hmm. I question everything and people probably don't like that, but actually develop the process. And there's a, there's a particular uh, type of, uh, there's two things that I think are important, intensity and velocity. And there's a level of intensity to her work, attention to detail to her work. That's extremely important to her. She she prides herself in that. And so mm. because of that, you can give her some work and she'll go roll with it. Mm. She'll take off and run and sprint towards finding those answers. Um, she's also, um, she's a self-starter. You don't, I don't have to, if she says she's doing something, she's doing it. I don't even have to question it. Mm. And so there's a level of discipline attached to that, that, uh, that you have to see in somebody. Mm-hmm. And then there's, there's always like, there's a, I guess it's just like a feel thing also where I can sit down with an agent and go get a sense and go, hmm, I, I, I see something in you. I think you have transferable skills and you have some ability um, that we can tap into. Now we just need to know if you'll be disciplined enough to do it daily. Mm-hmm. And so that's the way we, we look at it, but primarily agents in that two to two to six million range they're pressing up against their own capacity. I know right. they are. Because yeah. I've seen it too many times. Um, mm-hmm. Two to six, 10, 20, 30, 50, and 80 million are the marks that I saw agents go, getting comfortable, the space is feeling tight, or they're just frazzled. I have too much work to do. This is too hard. And I know that I know what to do to diagnose problems those days I know oh you probably have this going on this this and this and they go oh, how did you know because it's the same yep. the the solves to the problems may change but the actual problem remains the same at every step of the way and so because I've helped agents at those places jump from one place to another now I can reasonably understand what's going on with you and try the same treatments yeah it's just like a doctor the doctor goes Hmm, your blood pressure is high. I gave the last person this blood pressure medication and told them to eat this and exercise and it worked. Let me prescribe that same thing to you and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And by prescribing things over and over again, you get to a place where you start to understand these are the treatments for these ailments or these yeah. problems that they have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So I feel like what you've done is you, you, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you might have done both of them simultaneously but you had the opposite problem to where you created the opposite problem to where you ramped up the amount of opportunities coming in through the door for you guys. And now it's kind of like, you're like, well, now I have an agent problem. I need to bring in more agents to fulfill this demand. And so like, I feel like the traditional brokerage is on the opposite end of that to where their motives are, let's bring in a ton of agents and then just like rely on that Pareto's principle. I I believe that's what it is, the 80, 20 rule. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, and, and, and then you end up getting the problems that you were talking about where you have like the bottom agents, the middle group, and then that top producers, and then they start allocating their resources accordingly. What would you advise to a brokerage that's like, I get what you're doing. I see the results. 
like how can we make that shift to a brokerage that's more like yours to where we have bringing in more opportunities and then we're going to use the real estate agents and train the real estate agents to fulfill that yeah well one it's it's a culture problem they uh i think well one even a step before that brokerages focus in my mind too heavily on like making money from agents mm -hmm. they're they're not obsessed with making profitable agents they're just obsessed with making profit from agents mm. and so let's get more people in the door to try to keep the lights on so i can fill my own pocket but then you have to keep getting more people in the door because now it's a revolving door and there's some brokerages I'm, i won't call them out but they're revolving doors for agents so there's a ton of agents in but there's also a ton of agents out of the back door so while we were at compass um if we'd lost an agent it was a massive problem <laughs> i hear we would have debriefs and we'd have to talk to robert directly and robert would fly into atlanta and so now you have this ceo of this multi-billion dollar corporation sitting in front of you asking you how did you how could you have possibly lost this agent and so then my mind was you need to make agents profitable and they need to feel like you're helping them become profitable. Yep. And so brokerages who have the problem of um, building and they will come, like, I think that's like the model. If we have doors, agents will come in here and some of them will sell, some of them won't, but it's a numbers game. That's one of the one adages or sayings. And I, I, excuse my French, I fucking hate it. Yeah. I, I don't think anything's just the numbers game. Mm -hmm. I, that's not true. Because if you say that, then it would be like going to the basketball court and saying, everybody gets to shoot. It's a numbers game. Instead of saying, yeah. well, no, actually, Steph Curry shoots 10 times better than that guy. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a numbers game. It's about the yeah. preparation. It's a strategy you put in place to develop. And so if you do want to shift that, then what brokerages should be doing is figuring out ways to do both of those things I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. How do you help an agent eat right now? Help them eat. Spend your money to make them money and then teach them how to make their own money. Because what they're going to say is, man, you really helped me when I needed it. But now that I, now that you've taught me to do it myself, I'm indebted to you on both ends of the spectrum. You fed me and taught me how to feed myself. If you just feed somebody, resentment develops. There's no other way around it. At some point they're going to go, oh man, I, you know, it's cool that you're doing that, but. 50% is a lot. Why can't you do 40%? Because the other place is doing 40%. You know, so then that develops no matter what. But if you're on the other side of that, you can teach somebody something that they can now embody on their own. They go, wow, I'm better than I was before. I'm bigger yeah. than I was before. They stay and they're productive. And so I think that's the shift that they need to make from being profit from agents to profitable agents. And if they look at it that way, and there's some broker owners who are amazing at doing that, and they have a thriving agent community, they have less agents, so they're doing less work, but they're more productive per agent. There's a call a banker office in, uh, in Greenville, South Carolina, they're the most profitable per agent brokerage for all of Caldwell Bankers. In the, US. Mm -hmm. the owner is leaning into the agents. He's doing everything he can to help them sell better. Everything. And if he can do that, um, then he wins. And so I think that's what they need to do is sit on the same side of the table as your agents. Don't say like, oh, we're up here and they're there and they need to go out and figure it out. And if they do, and if, and if that's the approach you're going to take, then you will be the revolving door of real estate. And the top agent yeah. at some point, they're leaving. They're mm -hmm. going to leave. Like there's one franchise here. They were like, well, we do. What time it comes? We do profit share. I was like, "There's no profit to share in here because all the agents are with me now." Mm -hmm. I took all of your top people. There's no profit for anybody to share. The profit's over here now because we're mm -hmm. actually helping them. Yep. And so yep. I think we spent the last before, in my mind, before Compass, we spent the last probably ten years of brokers just being extremely lazy. Mm -hmm. Lazy, no innovation, no marketing changes, no value. They would just go, oh, the big broker just go like, well, let's just put valet parking because that'll make it look fancy. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's have a really fancy office because that'll make us look fancy. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, great. When, when an agent is smart and they 
who removed themselves from just being attached to the cachet of a brand. And wow. now I believe that every agent is their own brand. Frankly, you probably never know who, where anybody works at this point. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. since we don't know, we're in the industry, consumers have no idea. Mm -hmm. And so because you are your own brand, the brokerage is now your partner yep. in that brand. Mm -hmm. They are yep. not the brand. Yep. And as soon as they can get out of that mentality of thinking, well, we're I'm in this place or I'm, we're so big. And it's like, but you won't be. Mm -hmm. Blockbuster was really big at one point. So were taxis in, in, uh, in New York. Mm -hmm. So at some point, if you take for granted the position, there's another saying that I have, be not foolish as temporary king of the mountaintop. Do not think that you, you you only sit in that seat for so long if you don't continue to innovate and serve mm -hmm. the people, your, your prime client. And for brokerages, the client is not the homeowner and the home buyer. It's the agents who work yeah. there. That's your client. So. Yeah, that's, dude, I love that. So I found a, um, it was an article written on Real Trends. I have it pulled up here. It's a brokerage benchmark report. Over the past 10 years, firms are outperforming expectations. Keep that in mind. It's basically a report on tracking over the past 10 years, the all of the brokerages that they keep track of. And they're looking at profitability. They're doing two things. They're bringing in more agents, and then they're cutting their costs on expenses such as like marketing or something like that. And so, but... There was a piece of the the article that I was like reading through it and I was like, oh, that's interesting. At the bottom of it, it says it, th there's this uh, 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 data chart that says office performance. And this is where it goes into performance with the real estate agents. James, transactions per agent went down 17%. Gross margin per agent went down 37%. Um, and then the commission rates that the agents were bringing in went down 7%. And, and, and this is where I was like, okay, that, that kind of doesn't make sense. And if you were to switch those numbers, I would rather have 20 agents in my office and all 20 agents were averaging 40 transaction sides per agent and bringing in X amount of millions above industry uh, uh, um, um, averages rather than 200 agents and those same 20 agents are performing the way they're performing. And that's how brokerages are like set up now. And they think this is good. And so right. in my, yeah, and in my mind, I'm just like, and it, it just, it just makes me question, like, do they not see that? Or are they like not wanting to see that? I think, I think this is part of the problem too, is that the, it's hard to transition your business model, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of brokerages that are legacy models. They have splits and the top agents get the best splits. And if you bring over another top agent, they're going to get a little bit better split than the person before, and then one more. And so now you have these 10 people that are loss leaders in your office. And then you go, well, how do we offset this? Let's bring in rank and file agents. We know they're going to sell something, but they're not going to sell a lot, mm -hmm. right? And we don't have to allocate resources to them because they feel like they're not as good as the people at the top, but they're better than the people who aren't selling anything. So they're just happy to be here. <laughs> and so you develop this happy to be here culture for most individuals and they sit in that rank and file and you can squeeze a ton of juice out of those agents. That's, that's literally what keeps a brokerage open. It's not the top producers who are selling a ton. And so having just a split, then you have to go, well, how do we make more money? Okay, well, let's get more agents in here. Okay, and then let's increase fees. Let's increase our resource fee or whatever that is, the monthly cost to be here, tech fee, whatever they try to call it. Let's, mm -hmm. okay, let's charge a transaction fee. Every time they do a transaction, let's add that in there. Gotcha. Oh, we used to do this for free. Let's charge for that. Like there's some brokerages that were charging a print and color. I'm like, mm -hmm. why do you have a color printer? People have to pay you to print <laughs> in color. That's stupid. Um, <laughs> but they start nickel and diming the mm -hmm. agent. Who is their customer? who they forget is their customer and the people that are hurt the most, it's just like America, the middle class, mm -hmm. those people right in the middle, they're hurt the most and especially lower middle class, the two to six guys, they're getting mm -hmm. hurt two to, two to maybe eight and a half now, given that values are skyrocketing everywhere, mm -hmm. probably two to eight and a half, they're getting hammered um, because brokerages are saying that you, you should just be lucky to be here with these people at the top. 
at how great they are. If you stay here, you could potentially be like them. Mm -hmm. But most of those agents don't even care for that. They don't yeah. care for that guy. They, they don't, they're not aspiring to that. They're just happy with the lifestyle they've created in the time. They're, they own their own time. And, and so that legacy model is not going to work um, fruitfully forever unless you continue yeah. to nickel and dime. But there's, and this is why EXP is very unique in this, is that there's basically no overhead here. Yeah, they found a way to to uh, be very uh, Uber like. They don't have offices, but they have office spaces that you can go into and share. Right, mm -hmm. have a partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and so, because their cost is so low, they don't nickel and dime the agents. Once you pay your sixteen thousand dollars, if you do X number of transactions, they give it back to your company equity. And so you zero out. Um, that you zero that line item out in your own mind, and now their job is to get agents that are fruitful in doing transactions. Mm -hmm. And so the number of transactions will drive value to this brokerage. And so now you're not pigeonholed by let me go find the top cache agent who sells fifty million dollar houses, and everybody goes, "Wow, this person's the most amazing person. He's so rich." Like you don't even have to shoot for that. And like anything else, that's like everybody trying to go get LeBron James. Mm -hmm. He's going to be the most expensive, hardest to get, <laughs> over leveraged buy you could potentially make. Mm -hmm. But if you can get um, the individuals who come to work every day and they're producing, they're productive, now you find yourself in a place where you go, okay, great, I just need productive people. And mm -hmm. I don't have to um, fight tooth and nail and spend a ton of money to move these big rocks. Mm -hmm. And so... It's the uh, it, it, it's almost like these uh, you take you're taking small steps as opposed to you're taking small steps walking down the street versus the person who's trying to sprint. Yeah, um, the tortoise and the hare kind of mentality where you can only sprint for so long before yeah. you're exhausted, you're out of money, your people are tired, you're burnt out on the agents, you're, something's hurting if mm -hmm. you sprint for too long, but you can walk for days. Yeah. 100%. So I think that's, true. that's the difference between the two. So I, I think brokerages that have legacy models um, need to find ways to uh, transition their business from just splits. They mm -hmm. can't. And so that's why you see a lot of brokerages getting into ancillary services. Oh, now we have a mortgage company. Great. We'll mm -hmm. capture value on the mortgages. Oh, now we have a title company. Great. Now we'll capture more on the transactions. So you're going to see a lot more of that happening as we move move into the future, and you'll see a lot more brokerages pursuing teams. Yep. Because now you you get one team leader, you get six agents, mm -hmm. and if you get six agents, uh, there's going to be a, a lot of rank and file agents in there. Yeah. So you have the opportunity to capture more, but if you can get transaction volume up at any brokerage. And I think what you said is extremely important that I'd much rather have 20 high producing, extremely successful agents um, than to have 200 really mediocre agents because I'm gonna have to replace a hundred of them every single year. Mm -hmm. And so the cost to try to put a team together to go recruit another crop and then a, the cost of training that next hundred and then the cost of retaining the hundred that's trying to leave out the back door, uh, it, you find yourself in a position where you're you're giving away concessions um, that brokerages don't really need to to give away. Yeah. And so ho hopefully it changes. Uh, I think it should be a wake up call to a lot of those brokerages. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and what I, what I thought was. Uh, would be unique to brokerages is like if they can create tech or they can create marketing process or something that's unique um, and win, but you can replicate that stuff now, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that shouldn't be your claim to fame. It's you can I, you can replicate nearly anything that any brokerage does on your own. Yeah. So now, what value does that partnership bring you? Yeah. So every agent should be asking that. These, and I, I've probably heard me say this, but I think it's true. There's three things that a brokerage partnership should have. One, the opportunity for steady and growing income. Mm -hmm. Can I make money? 
can I even make money here? And can I make more money? Right? Clear and compelling future. Do they know what's coming? Are they going to help me prepare for it? And then freedom from and freedom to. Is my job easier or harder to do? And does it free me up to do the things that I actually really want to do? I don't know any human on the planet who's like, if I could do anything, it's work. I don't think that's our goal, right? You're going to spend time with your family. You want to travel, whatever your true hobbies are. And if the brokerage partnership isn't doing all three of those things, and they're not asking that question of themselves every single day, are we doing these things? Mm. You're going to be on the wrong side of history in the long run. Yeah. Very true. I love all of your insight. I love the way that you break down um, concepts. And dude, I have a, um, this is my last question for you. Right now, I have this vision uh, that I am pursuing in building this community of top performers, top teams, um, top broker owners, team leaders, just just, um, people who are performing at a high level, individuals. And alongside them in the community is also going to be marketing experts and um i'm still considering if just i just want to seclude it to real estate but um or get the opinions of like cmos at fortune 500 companies and stuff like that as well um but i overall i want to create this community of both of them in order for us to like house all of the um data that comes from the campaigns that we're running all of the um, frameworks, methodologies, the strategies that come along with marketing campaigns, all with the purpose of making sure that individuals like yourself and Ashley can continue innovating based on how the consumer is consuming. And so yeah. in order to do that, obviously I have to have the collective individuals in this group. But with that in mind, um, what specifically whether it's marketing or business wise, is there anything specifically that you need help with right now that you're looking to overcome that I may interview someone in the future, maybe a marketing expert or another, you know, top producer in their market that, that may, may have the answer to. Yeah. It's a, that's a good question. That's a, a really good question to ask. And that was the one question that I saw on the list and I was like, huh, I have to think about that one. Um, because if I could ask any question, what what always drives me is um, is how do we how do we anticipate client activity through marketing? Mm-hmm. How do we how do we how how are we persuasively getting people to how are we persuasively attracting people? How do you know? How can we start to anticipate? Like we have this. We have this great, really great lead partnership, but what if I could predict, truly predict through marketing efforts or whatever, through data, when somebody truly is ready mm. and how can I be the first person to get there? Mm. That's always my my obsession. When you talk about production, distribution, um, either own the raw material or you own the distribution channel, but if you own both, <laughs> if you own the product and all of the distribution, you own you have a monopoly mm-hmm. on that process. There's nothing that anybody can do to stop you. Mm-hmm. And so I've, I've always been if, if someone can help, those are the things that I, I obsess about is how can we use marketing data? You know, so the question I had at Compass first was how do I predict agent movement? What are the factors? And I figured figured out some of them, but I never got to fully run like an experiment of, hey, we've moved X number of agents. Where's the data on why they moved? What was the inflection point that moved them? And like, what are the circumstances around it? And what can we extrapolate from that? Mm-hmm. And so I would love to do the same thing with marketing is that, okay, we ran all of these campaigns, which one of them was really successful at anticipating Mm. movement because if we can anticipate that a buyer is interested in buying before they buy then we get to them before anybody else does yeah i think that's where in my mind where data and marketing should marry is that oh great all of these data points have been hit the probability that somebody's ready is now we should be marketing to them. Mm. or 
we know that this means in three months they're going to be ready, we should already be marketing to them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how can marketing and data marry there in the anticipation of it? Because if we can get there, then we control um, you know, the raw lead and the distribution because now they're going through us. And then how do we how do, that there's probably more problems with that stuff, but if it's marketing <laughs> specifically, that's yeah. that's what I would love to that's what I'm obsessed with currently. Mm -hmm. Um and I try to go back to like Jonah Berger and all of the great economists and marketers that are that are out there and just listen to their material and figure out through their past study because I think history is extremely important to to figuring out patterns. Mm -hmm. But if I could figure out the patterns, I think I'm surprised, frankly, that companies like Zillow um, have not figured it out. Mm -hmm. um, which is surprising, extremely surprising to me with the, all of their money and data they own. Now they own showing time, they like own all the data mm -hmm. and they still haven't figured out how to truly anticipate. And I think there's some AI that started to come out and Joseph Sorosh and that compass, I think may still be there, may have left, but he was great at creating, creating some predictive um, possibilities for when people are likely to sell, mm -hmm. but and there was something that you could really hang your hat on, like, hey, through these whatever number of data points, I understand that Cameron will sell or will be ready to buy in three months, but Cameron doesn't even know it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some places like pay close attention to Rocket, Rocket Mortgage. Mm -hmm. They have that new app connected to FinLocker. Yeah. And what they're doing is looking at if you can re if you have access to somebody's banking and credit history then you have an idea of when they're mortgage eligible. 100%. And so I think they're heading in that direction. Um, but who, who's going to get there first? And whoever yeah. does is the Uber. Yeah. Like we, no one ever says, no one ever says, call the lift. Yeah. We all say call an Uber no matter what happens. Yeah. 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 So somebody's got to be that, that player. Mm -hmm. And whoever can get there fastest wins. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, and so I'm obsessed with figuring that out mm -hmm. for us, and then scaling it, and hopefully that helps agents all over the place create better business through um, predictable outcomes. Yep. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's so interesting because <laughs> that's so interesting because like I've I've been very curious on that as well. Um, I I've gone back to like research. Um, theories from psychologists and psychiatrists on human behavior just to see like how humans go about problem solving um, because I think at the end of the day like that's that's the purpose of the business the business is through their products and services solving a problem for the consumer and so then I started looking at okay well how do consumers problem solve then and so like I actually found like a um, I believe his name was John Dewey in 1901, he created what's called the consumer decision-making process. And it starts with, first of all, the you know recognition of a need and ending with the uh, um, analyzing the purchase as a whole. Like, did they make the right decision? And the, the I want to say the more high ticket the item is, the uh, longer it takes to go through this process. And so for something like a, oh yeah, for something like a home, I think, I think, figuring out the if then behavior of somebody about to get into the market of buying a home before they even before they even knew it um yeah i i feel like in my in my just you know all the research and all you know campaigns that i'm testing and stuff like that i feel like the core of it is just analyzing consumer behavior and then you've done that like you're going through the process that you naturally go through of like okay let's analyze that for 2000 um homeowner uh sorry well, depending on the target audience and see, this is why it gets complex because everybody's motive is different when it comes to real estate. There's investors, there's renters, there's, you know, everything. Yeah. And so, and, and it's, it can get, because real estate is hyper local, you could go homeowners in this pocket neighborhood mm -hmm. behave differently than neighbors across the street. Mm -hmm. And so how do you, in there's no way without great computation power that we can do that, but um, with that, with with the the path that I think comes from AI and its ability 
to better predict outcomes and they got to get it right right but it's getting close yeah it's, it's getting close to a place and i think with companies like open ai um, and their product chat which is a lovely lovely yeah. a lovely resource for any human who's alive uh-huh. out of your age um it now levels playing field and i think we've been moving towards that as, as a society mm-hmm. anyway where now instead of going to a brokerage office and saying hey do you have any agents and agents jump up and try to run to the door to get a person or typing up to the owner so that he can give you some leads you can literally go direct to the consumer because of social media and mm-hmm. so you cut out the middleman which is the brokerage and so i think what ai will do is help us level the playing field against big companies who have a ton of data it can scrape data just as fast as zillow's uh, developers can or have whatever system they put in place and so now if i can leverage the same power and i think this is what's right for innovation anyway we should not say hey only the people with the most money get a chance to innovate that's not how henry ford created foreign motor company that's not how the rockefellers created their wealth it's, it's just not how it happened in america and so we've now gone to a place where that's the way it works where either you create something and they buy from you and shelf it because it's competing with something that they already have or they just box you out because they have so much money the walmarts of the world where you can go to a small town and say oh the mom and pop place so you can sell directly to us so we're going to close you down and sell your same product for less and so this this advent of the level of technology that we're seeing now i think levels some of that for us and so now if you have the ability to do that you should you should run after it as fast as you can and try to uh to place your stamp on problems that you think you can solve and use the resources that are out there don't don't shy away from it don't run away I think there's a lot of agents go like i don't i don't want to use that if it's not broke don't fix it it's like yeah but sometimes Things that aren't broke still aren't great. Like mm-hmm. the horse and buggy wasn't broke. Mm-hmm. That was a great way of getting around, but a car is so much faster. Mm-hmm. Screaming at a person or writing a letter is really effective. It's not a broke <laughs> way of doing things, but a telephone works a lot better. Yep. Right? Yep. And so I, I think we have to think about it that way, not just as an industry, but as a human race. We should promote technological advancement and we mm-hmm. should give it as many people as possible an opportunity to have a shot at it. And if that happens, then we have rapid um, expansion. Mm-hmm. And instead, where where we are today, where we, um, when did the internet come out? How much has it changed since it's been out? Like, or they or they do things like three G, four G, five G, LTE, and it's like, it's, is it is it actually better than the product before? Or are, and I think this is specifically an American problem because if you look at other countries, their technology is a lot better than ours. Even the way that they run their cities, um, especially um, cities in like Japan, and mm. their technological advancement surpassed us primarily because we've now gotten to a place where none of that matters. Innovation doesn't matter, money does. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times, like you said, with brokerages, they look profitable because they're sh- they're cutting cutting fast and goes like yeah we made 100 we made 100 million and we spent 100 million but if we spend 80 haha we mm-hmm. we made 20 million dollars everybody we, we're above board and it's like yeah but you didn't make any advancement mm-hmm. you just and i think a lot of times that's the problem is that we're just trying to subtract things in order to look good to the market because mm-hmm. now everything that we do is for the shareholder as opposed to saying um, like a Costco or a Trader Joe's or private companies, they just go, we don't care. Mm-hmm. We're going to do what we think is right. And those companies, Costco's massive. Mm-hmm. It's a massive operation. It's because they don't care. And I, so I think innovation should live in that space. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, these are really long answers. I'm realizing that I keep giving you. But, <laughs> I, and I go off on, I'm going off on these like rants. <laughs> but I, I think technology should be in the hands of everybody. Everybody should have access to the resources because it helps all of us mm-hmm. we all benefit when a nikola tesla has an opportunity to create the power that we use now is from him mm-hmm. right 
but if, but imagine if he was he you know Thomas Edison or whoever at the time decided I think Weston House was the person who finally pushed him forward I believe that's true but mm-hmm. imagine if they just shelved him and they go yeah give me all your ideas put them on the shelf we're going to use direct current mm-hmm. and we have we have 500,000 electrocution deaths every year because people are stepping on live wires. Like, <laughs> imagine what society would look like if we didn't let him get his products off or somebody didn't support his product. So, yeah. or his ideas. And we should be doing that as a society. Yeah, 100%. I definitely agree. Definitely agree. James, it's, it's a pleasure talking to you, man. I could, I could like pick your brain for a long time. <laughs> um yeah it's yeah it's definitely uh i definitely appreciate the time dude and um um i definitely this is how i know i have really good podcast episodes james is where near the well one i don't want to end it and then two i want to rewatch it as soon as possible and and i really feel like this that that's how this podcast was so i definitely appreciate your brain and your genius and all your smarts man Man, thank you. I, I appreciate you having me. Um, I appreciate Limo. Shout out to Joseph Limo uh-huh. um, for for inviting me to sit down and talk. And yeah, I'm, I'm always. This is a. Uh, I think this is the type of discourse that's necessary. Mm-hmm. We don't typically talk about ideas anymore. We uh, somebody introduces an idea, and then everybody in the comments go, "That's stupid. Mm-hmm. What an idiot. He's dumb." And now we're just we we've gone from like <laughs> society. Mm-hmm. It's having elevated conversations to name calling. Mm-hmm. And so we've, uh, we've descended into the depths of uh, fourth grade, third grade again. And 100%. hopefully through a conversation like this, more people um, coming together to just discuss ideas. Mm-hmm. Maybe that helps. Mm-hmm.